নমস্কার মূল জয়শ্রী চৌধুরী তখন ইডিওটিকর আজির সেশন আমার মাজত আছে আমেরিকা যুক্তরাষ্ট্রের মিনিসোটা স্টেট ইউনিভার্সিটি এসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর মাইকেল জে রুটকৌস্কি বর্তমান তখে নাসার নিউরো ডাইভার্সিটি প্রজেক্ট এটার সুপারভাইজার হিসাবেও কর্মরত গতি তখেতক আমার এই সেশন লো স্বাগত জানাইছো তখেতর যে জার্নি তখেতর যে অভিজ্ঞতা তার জড়িয়ে এই কথোপকথনের জড়িয়ে আমি সেই বিষয়ে জানো আহ উয়ের থ্রিল টু ওয়েলকাম ডক্টর মাইকেল জে রুটকৌস্কি এন্ড এসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর অফ এস্ট্রোনমি এট মিনিসোটা স্টেট ইউনিভার্সিটি মানকেটো উইথ এ পিএইচডি ইন এস্ট্রোফিজিক্স ফ্রম এরিজোনা স্টেট ইউনিভার্সিটি ডক্টর রুটকৌস্কিস রিসার্চ ফোকাসেস অন স্টার্ট ফর্মিং গেলেক্সিজ রি আয়নাইজেশন এন্ড ইভলিউশন অফ মেসিক গেলেক্সিজ হি হ্যাজ কন্ট্রিবিউটেড টু মাল্টিপল স্পেস বেসড এস্ট্রোফিজিক্স প্রজেক্টস এন্ড ইজ অলসো ইনভলভ ইন নাসাস নিউরো ডাইভার্সিটি নেটওয়ার্ক এজ এ রিসার্চ সুপারভাইজার নাও His work continues to inspire uh, budding astrophysics across the globe and we are excited to dive into his journey today to this uh, conversation. So uh, once again, I welcome you to our platform from on behalf of my, the team Idiotic. Uh, so let's start the video. Uh, first of all, we would like to know a bit about your early life and what actually inspired you to pursue astrophysics sure so thank you uh namaskar as well um and uh it's a pleasure to be here um i'm happy to um, um i ho hope that students that watch this uh have you get 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 some insight into what it means to be an astrophysicist because i think that sometimes astrophysics is seen as being this very um i mean it is difficult you need a lot of math a lot of science but it also requires you to be curious in order to be successful at it and curiosity is not something that you know just one type of person has so um hopefully there'll be some students who 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 see this as an option that they may not have considered before yeah. um so my my background um i grew up in uh, i'm from virginia originally on the east coast of the united states um i grew up in a very small town uh, it was about uh, 250 people um it was mostly fisher fishermen um and uh we had uh, oysters and crabs and um that was mostly what we fished there um on the chesapeake bay um i think that astronomy was always attractive to me because of where i grew up in part because i grew up in a place that had dark skies i could always see the milky way i could always see the stars i remember very much um very well when i was a little kid about um maybe in uh, middle uh, elementary school um it was probably about 1990 1991 um there was a comet and i've never bothered to look it up but i think it was uh it was a comet that came came by and my dad i remember he woke us up early at, early in the morning and he said we're gonna we're gonna go see this comet and that was uh you know we were of course not so happy because we were being woken up early in the morning to go into the cold weather outside to watch something that none of us had had any idea what it was going to look like or how impressive it would be but it was really impressive and it was really exciting to see this and I think that because I was in such a rural area there weren't a lot of lights so we could see it and that's something that a lot of people who grow up, I mean, if you grow up in Mumbai, if there's a comet flying overhead, you probably are not going to see it because there's just so much light from the, the city itself. So um, I think that my path into astrophysics itself, I, I think every little kid at some point thinks that they maybe they'll grow up and be an astronaut. Um, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, uh, that was really a dream for me. And then as I was getting older into high school, um, I realized uh, that astronauts needed to be a certain height. You need to be relatively small in order to fit into the spacecraft. And I was getting taller and taller every year. And I thought, oh, no, what if I spend my whole career trying to be an astronaut and then I'm too tall to fit and then I don't get the I don't I don't get to to go to space because I, I just end up training or something. So um, in high school, I said, well, I like physics. Um, I like my math courses and astrophysics. You know, I can still do space related things. So I sort of moved into that. Um, my first research wasn't actually in astrophysics, but by the time I was a sophomore in college, I was I was just interested. I was I knew that I was going to do something in astronomy. I didn't know if it was going to be faculty or planetarium or something, but I, I, I really wanted to be in astrophysics. So. Yeah, uh, you wanted to be an astronaut since childhood. So is there any specific moments or 
any one mentor someone that guided you throughout this journey yeah days? sure um i would say my parents my parents were um always supportive of me being creative you know just you know we i grew up i grew up before the internet so you know when i wanted to go learn about something we had to go to the library and so we had to you know my parents always took me to the library if i wanted to go to my library they never um they never said oh we're too busy to go to the library um so having you know parents who um don't necessarily tell you what to do but can support what it is that you say you're interested in is, is always helpful um i think in high school there were a couple of professors or faculty who's you know encouraged me to um you know to not worry so much about all of the oh can you still see me yeah yeah, yeah. oh Okay, my it went dark on my end, but anyway, um, because it's just been a flaky internet. But um, there were a lot of faculty who said, you know, don't worry so much about. Or not they didn't say this directly, but they said, you know, if you want to explore science or you want to do math, just do it. You know, don't worry about all the social aspects of high school. You know, everyone's going to be awkward and weird. Just find your little niche in in the in whatever it is that you're interested in and go go and explore it. Um, and they were always very supportive of, you know, what 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 things I was curious about. Um, and then I guess as I got a little bit older, I remember very early there was a, there's an individual. Um, he's since passed away, I, be, I believe um, I should check this, actually. <laughs> but um, his name was Wilkinson. Prof uh, he was a professor at Princeton, and he uh, did a lot of early work with studying the what we call the cosmic microwave background, which is remnant radiation, leftover light, basically, from when hydrogen first formed in the universe. Um, 100,000 years after the Big Bang, very, very high, very distant. And I remember I just got an email address and I emailed him and I said, because there had just been a launch of a new spacecraft called the WMAP probe, not so relevant here um, uh, for storytelling, but I emailed him and I said, oh, it's so wonderful that this is launched and it's making all these great discoveries. And I really hope that, you know, I'm thinking about doing astrophysics and I hope that when I get to college and do it, that there's still going to be questions to answer and he said oh he, he emailed me back i remember and he said oh don't worry you know there'll be lots of questions to solve um there's gonna be lots of things to do keep keep at it keep doing physics keep doing astronomy um there'll be lots to do when you get here and so that was that was a really nice um contact to have just sort of out of the blue um i decided to email and he decided to email back um I don't know if they do that now because it's so it's so easy to send email and everything people get constantly contacted but that was a really nice um, a, a moment in in my development, I think, um, to be told by someone in the field that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's as exciting as you think it is. You know, it, it's hard work, but, you know, there is the chance to really make um, discoveries, you know, every year there can be some big revolutionary shift in our understanding. So to be part of that was um, to have that affirmed that I would be part of that later if I stayed on this path was really um, beneficial, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, as you did your academics in US, so how did your academic journey in the US develop? Uh, were there any particular challenges that you faced during your studies? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in, in the US, um, you typically don't take physics until maybe your junior or senior year in high school. So you're already starting off behind a lot of the rest of the world. I mean, if you're in India, you're probably taking physics starting in, you know, the beginning of high school, at least maybe even earlier, if you've already been identified as being, a, you know, mathematically inclined or, um, you know, or you're at a specialized school. Um, but um, we started it late, um, which meant that, you know, the first couple of years of uh, undergraduate physics were... Um, focused on physics and not so much the other things that you might need in order to do astrophysics because you needed to uh, firm up those fundamental. And so one of the things that I noticed very quickly when I got to grad school is that um, even though my physics foundation was as good as anyone else's that came in, my um, coding, for example, my ability to write software to do the things that I want to do. And I'm not talking about, you know, massive simulations or something, but, you know, just the ability to um, build a, a basic software that would, you know, put a hundred particles into a box and, 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 and apply gravity and see what, what happens, you know, something like that. Um, 
the conceptual idea of that really had never been developed and I didn't have any coding expertise. So I had taken one course in Fortran, but when I got to grad school, everyone said, oh, we'll use this code MATLAB to, to answer this homework problem. And I thought, I have no idea what MATLAB is. So that was really scary the first semester or two that I was in because I thought, man, I'm going to be so far behind. But, you know, I found friends who knew how to do it and were willing to work together with me and, um, you know, just putting in the hours myself in the lab to um, get the answers solved, um, was able to, to keep pushing through. So um, I think the, the, the scary parts or the difficult parts for me are is when I thought I kind of understood what was going to be happening next. And then there was a total curveball because someone said, you know, in class, okay, now you're going to use this software to do this. And you've never even heard of that software. That's really scary. And then yeah. um, really um, makes you anxious about what, are you going to be able to perform at the level you need to in order to pass your classes that semester or um, move forward in the, in the degree. So I think that, I think the development was, uh, the, the key points in the development were like realizing you have to oftentimes learn a lot more than what is being discussed in the class itself. Um, and when you learn something in class, try to continue learning that because it's probably going to show up again, or it could be to your benefit to have that um, expertise because you may have to solve a problem in the future where having that expertise, not just forgetting it after you did the homework set comes, comes in handy. Yeah, so like, uh, like uh, the position you are now, like the Zani. So, there, is there any key moments like uh, you would like to share with us, like throughout your journey, like in astrophysics and this area, like, like which shaped like this moment shape you would like to say, like it shaped me this my position now. Where are you? Yeah. Like, so, I think key moments in my getting to where I was. One of the key moments was the first time I realized that um, I'm capable of doing the work that other people are doing in the field, that everyone in the in the field may be very intelligent, but there's still a place for me to do the work that I want to do that um, we call it in the US like imposter syndrome, like a feeling that maybe you really don't belong there because you're just not you didn't you didn't go to the right school or you didn't you didn't take the right tutoring or something um but so i remember in grad school for example i had the idea of um uh there was my my advisor was not really terribly familiar with the work that i wanted to do in my phd and i said to him look i you know this is what i'm interested in this is the data we have i think we can do some really neat work with this and he he said well go find a place where you could do that and then i'll you know, set you up to go work there. And so I found that, you know, there was a, a colleague at Oxford University that was very good at, at this sort of work at, at a different, in a different, slightly different field, a different, different redshift. And I, I emailed them and said, hey, could I come for a couple of, of months? And I showed up and I just did the work there and learned a, a lot. And that was a really, that was a real confidence building mo moment where I realized that you know, I could offer new things to a group. I could do things on my own independently. I could do real science on my own independently. Um, that I sort of carried that in. I worked in Korea for a year through a U.S. supported fellowship there at Yonsei University and was able to build confidence there. I was largely working independently um, and I was just able to do what I thought was exciting science for a year, 10 months or so. And those were those were both moments where I felt confident about where I was. And, and those you, you need to you need to have moments where you pull back and you ask yourself, you know, am I just doing what I'm told or am I doing something that's setting me up for a career path that I would be um, able to do the sort of science that I'm interested in doing? Um, and if you find that you're just doing what your professor tells you, but you don't have any interest in it, then, you know, start, you know, poking and trying to bend the, the contours of, of the project a little bit so that it is exciting to you. Because the thing about astrophysics is if you do, it's, it's going to be hard. 
it's going to be hard to do what you, what you're doing. So when it gets really hard, you need to be able to to have something else to rely on to keep you engaged. And so you need to be excited about what you're doing. If you're not excited, when it gets really hard, you're going to give up on it. So find the way to make uh, your passions your work in astrophysics. And if you can do that, you'll be able to 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 push forward. So. And I think, you know, if I look back at my history, the times when I was able to find the passion mm -hmm. with the project was were moments that I was able to continue pushing forward in the in the in the sun. Yeah, it's great to know your journey. It's a very inspiring journey. Uh, definitely, audience will get inspiration from your journey. Yeah, if we come to your research field, uh, as you have worked on a lot of fascinating research, could you please tell us about any recent or ongoing project that you were particularly excited about? Sure. So a lot of what I do is based on um, ultraviolet observations. So in order to observe the ultraviolet, you need a, you need a space-based observatory. So I use things like Hubble. In the past, I've used a U.S. telescope called Galax. And I actually use now, a, um, I work very closely with an uh, Kanak Saha at, at uh, Ayuka in Pune. Um, and we use the AstroSat satellite, which has a UV instrument um, capable of observing the universe at uh, about 1500 angstroms, 150 nanometers. So very, very short wavelengths of light compared to what your eyes can perceive. With that, there's a lot of things that you can do because the UV tells you about star formation. So wherever star formation is happening, you can see it in the UV typically. And so if it's happening in merging galaxies, then you take an interest in merging galaxies and star formation. If it's happening in old galaxies where you wouldn't expect to find stars, that's really interesting. That's a lot of what I, I do. Um, there's a, a, a big question of how the hydrogen between galaxies, um, it's how it became um, to be ionized, so free electrons and free protons from its neutral state when it was first formed in the early universe. Um, that requires you to understand how the ionizing photons, so the, the, the photons with energy sufficiently high that they can break the hydrogen atoms apart, um, not break them apart, I guess, but to separate, to ionize the electron from the proton. How do they get out of galaxies? Where do they come from in galaxies? Um, how many of them are there? All of these questions require the ultraviolet. So a lot of my research is focused on the ultraviolet observations through Hubble or uh, AstroSat nowadays. Current work, though, also uses, or that's all current work, but there's also ongoing work because we have more telescopes than just the ultraviolet. And so I use things like the James Webb Space Telescope, again, to study star formation, and oftentimes to study star formation in the ultraviolet. But James Webb doesn't work in the ultraviolet. It works in the um, infrared. But because we sit in a universe that's expanding, as the light from distance galaxies makes its way across the expanding universe, it gets redshifted. So the light that's emitted in the ultraviolet by the time it hits the Earth may actually be in the in the infrared. So we can detect it with the James Webb Space Telescope. So we can do all the sort of same science that I'm doing um, for more local galaxies or, or lower redshift galaxies closer to the Earth. Um, but we can do it for earlier galaxies, more distant galaxies. And so we can start to answer bigger questions about, you know, how do things change over time? How does star formation change over time? How does dust change over time? How does the um, the structure and shapes of galaxies change over time. And that's what a lot of my current current work is focused on. Uh, yeah, you are doing great research and great work. So your work in astrophysics has drawn a lot of attention. So how do you think your research could influence the future of space exploration or how we understand the universe? The one of the ways in which it will really help is right now we have this really big problem um, in astrophysics um, that says when the universe was formed, there was nothing there initially. It was just energy, pure energy. Um, it was too hot for particles to even form. You couldn't form electrons. You couldn't form protons. But in about the first 100,000 years of the universe, protons and electrons came into existence. They found each other. They made hydrogen. And then for a period of a couple hundred million years, maybe 150 million years after that, 
Nothing happened in the universe. You just had gas, neutral gas. But then something really interesting happened. That gas started to collapse. It started to form stars and stars started to form within larger assemblies of stars, which, you know, would have been the first galaxies. When those stars formed, they started to release ultraviolet radiation, infrared radiation, so on and so forth into the galaxy and eventually into the space between galaxies, what we call the, the intergalactic medium. And presumably they were producing a lot of ionizing photons and they liberated all those electrons. And when we look at the, if we look between us and the nearest galaxies, all the hydrogen that we find in between those galaxies, not associated with the galaxies themselves, but all the hydrogen we find in between is ionized. It doesn't exist as neutral hydrogen. It's been separated. And the reason is because there's enough radiation in the universe that I keeps it ionized. The question is how? We think our theory says that when the universe was forming these stars and galaxies, these stars are so bright in the ultraviolet, they ionize everything. Eventually later, maybe you have quasars and which are actively accreting black holes in the centers of galaxies. They produce a lot of ultraviolet radiation too. That all gets out of galaxies and it ionizes everything. The problem is, is that when we look for this ionizing radiation where we can find it, it's often not there. It's, it's not coming out of galaxies to the extent that we would expect it to be coming out of galaxies in order for all of this hydrogen to be ionized. And so what I think I'm doing in my research, what I hope I'm doing in my research is trying to point out ways of solving this problem by looking at galaxies to find this escaping radiation, this ionizing radiation. And for a long time, we've, we've done, it's been really tough. We haven't found many galaxies. In the past about 10 years, um, in part through AstroSat, um, in part through more focused surveys with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to find um, escaping radiation. The next step is that if these galaxies that we see producing escaping radiation are like the galaxies in the distant universe, then we might be able to make the logical assumption that these galaxies here produce this much radiation, Therefore, in the distant universe, they probably also produce a similar amount of radiation. And then that could solve the problem of how did it, over cosmic time, all of these, all this gas be, be ionized. The problem is, with that, is we find a galaxy that's producing Lyman continuum or this ionizing radiation, but we can't observe that ionizing radiation in the distant universe because there's still neutral gas between us and that, and that galaxy, and that neutral gas absorbs all this radiation. And so we can't see it actually producing the radiation. So what we need to do is come up with a, an analogy or a proxy um, for the galaxy. So what we do is we say, well, this type of galaxy that's forming stars at a thousand solar masses or more per year, we say, we find that these galaxies are on average producing this amount of radiation. And so then what we can do is find the galaxies that are producing it, or stars at a thousand solar masses per year in the distant universe and infer then how much radiation they're producing. The problem is, is that there's no one proxy that we can point to that's one to one. So when we find strongly star forming galaxies, we often find that there's a lot of strongly star forming galaxies that aren't producing any, Lyman, uh, any ionizing radiation. We look at uh, emission lines, you know, we find really strong emission lines of hydrogen or oxygen or something in these galaxies. We say, OK, we look at this sample of strongly uh, strong O3 uh, oxygen emitters. Well, some of them are producing lots of ionizing radiation that we can observe in the local universe, but some of them aren't. And so we can't say then that this metric is going to give you a one to one um, or one-to-one -one measure of the escaping ionizing radiation in the distant universe where you can't observe it directly. So one of the things that I'm also trying very hard to do is to find metrics where, you know, it, where it's an, where it's an if then statement, if this is true about the galaxy, then it produces this amount of radiation guaranteed. It's not a 50% chance that it's going to be emitting at this amount. It's not 10%, it's 100% that we can expect this much. And then what we can do is take that metric and go to the distant universe 
and say, where are all the galaxies like this? Add them all up, and then we'll know how much uh, radiation they're producing. And then we'll be able to solve this question of what happened to hydrogen over the past 13 billion years that it went from being neutral to ionized. How did that happen? How, what, how did that process move forward? So I hope that's my contribution to this. Yeah. And if you think about it, it may not sound like such a big, a big question to answer, but it is a very big question because 76% or so of all the stuff in the universe that we can see, all the matter, all the stuff that you'd find on the periodic table is in the form of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element by far in the, in the universe. So understanding how it formed and evolved is a pretty important question if you want to understand the physics of matter in the universe. So, yeah. Uh, do you think that international collaborations are important or how important these are uh, for scientific processes, especially for uh, especially in space science, and do you have any experience with this? Yeah, so I think it's extremely important, and the reason is because it's really expensive to do this sort of work. Um, you have to launch rockets. You have to build, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of, you know, observatories to put into space. Even if you don't go to space, you still have to have a mountain somewhere and put an observatory on top of it. That might cost tens of millions of dollars to build and and do it um, uh, well. Not every country has access to that amount of money that they can, you know, there are lots of other things we could be spending our money on as, as nations. And so the best thing to do is to have the nations come together and each of them contribute a little bit to a bigger project and be able to do science um, th that's at, you know, the cutting edge. And so I think international collaborations are, are really important um, because uh, it gives people access who might not otherwise have access to instruments or techniques or infrastructure. Um, you know, you can't, well, yeah, so th I think that's important. Um, it gives um, opportunities for collaborations on um, w bringing together people who think about things differently. Um, if you only work within one small group and everybody thinks about the problem the same way, you might be able to get the Nobel Prize. But in order to solve all the questions that you want to solve, it's good to have people who are thinking about the same thing, but in a slightly different way. Um, so, you know, maybe one country invests a lot in radio and the other countries invest a lot in the ultraviolet. You should bring those two groups together because they might be studying the same thing, but from a different angle. And that could give them that by collaborating together, you might get new insight into the the way things work, um, uh, the physics behind the question that you're trying to answer. So I think it's really important, and especially for, uh, um, I mean, just for, in a, in the basic sense, for sort of international friendships. I mean, it's really hard for uh, one country to dislike another country when the when people are working together between those countries. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of tension right now between, say, U.S. and, and China, for example. Um, but there's a lot of Chinese astronomers working in the U.S., and there's a lot of U.S. astronomers who work in China, and that's that does something for the diplomatic state of affairs, especially when it's in astrophysics where the technology can be very sensitive or the, um, the expenses can be really high. To be able to share technology and whatnot um, opens up new... Um, pathways. So, um, you know, with with India, I, I, I do work. Um, uh, before my visit, I was working with Kanak almost exclusively in India. But since then, I was able to come to, to Tejpur and give a talk and, and meet a faculty member there um, who had a PhD student who I was the external reviewer for their dissertation. But I never thought I would ever meet these people. I just was reading and reviewing and giving comments on their PhD. But then I was able to go there and meet them. And that's turned into making new um, collaboration with Tejpur on on topics. Because, you know, I'm at a university that doesn't have a PhD program, for example. Um, but I work with a lot of people and work within a field that has access to a lot of data and new data. and. Maybe the Indian students don't have access to direct access to a certain telescope, 
that that I do, but they have, you know, skills and 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 uh, training and background that can um, contribute meaningfully to publishing papers and producing good science with those those telescopes. So, you know, collaborations are are really important. You you just can't do, you can't understand the entire universe on your own. You you need to enlist everyone that you possibly can, and so, um, yeah, I I I I, I work with a lot of people internationally because of, for that reason. For the Recently, you became a research supervisor for NASA Bio Neurodiversity Network. Uh, could you please explain what this role involves and the kind of work you do there? The, the Neurodiversity Program is a, a really new program for NASA. And last summer was my first year um, working with it. And this is a really neat program which allows NASA funded scientists to work with high school students um, who are on um, who are what we in the US we call them neurodivergent. Um, there's lots of names, classifications and whatnot, medical terms, some of them valid, some of them not. But um, basically uh, students who um, are neurodivergent, uh, many of them are autistic, for example, or they have um, um, Asperger's syndrome. I don't know if you're familiar with those terms, but they're they're um, they just have different different ways of um, communicating. They have different ways of interacting. They have different uh, uh, emotional sensitivities than other people. They're you know, but they're doing. They're able to do good science, and they're interested in doing science. So I had a student who was um, um, neuro neurodivergent who I worked with. Um, for a summer to identify a set of galaxies in a, in a brand new data set um, from James Webb that appeared to be merging together. So we've just looked at the galaxies and we tried to, and we had to look at tens of thousands of galaxies and we tried to find the set of galaxies that looked like they had recently interacted with each other. They sort of had experienced a train wreck or a collision or something. And the reason we were interested in that is because if we could identify that sample of galaxies, then we could use computers in the future to train on that set of merging galaxies. And then hopefully we could release that model on a large data set and it would find all these mergers for us. When we got to the end of the summer, we had the set. We tried to use the set of data to find mergers and it didn't work. We, we didn't find very good results. I think that we have since figured out what the issue was. It was probably that we didn't have enough galaxies to train on. Um, and we found some new ways to build that set of training samples up. Um, and so we're, I'm looking forward to restarting it, probably finding another um, uh, with, through the NASA Neurodiversity Program, um, find another high school student who wants to learn how to you know, train a machine learning code with Python. Um, and you know, start finding these galaxies in in these data, these big data sets. Um, so it was successful. Um, it took us a step forward. Um, we got a good sample, but um, the the stretch goal for the program um, we're going to revisit uh, probably next summer um, or the or the the during the next uh, twenty five twenty six year. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, there are many young people in India, especially in northeastern region or in Assam, uh, those who are really passionate about science and space. So what advice uh, would you like to give them who are uh, looking forward to pursue a career in astrophysics or astronomy? I think this? the the um, a few points of advice. One, the first is that um, physics and math is really important. You, 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 you need to um, engage in um, those classes as, as, as much as you can. Wherever those opportunities arise, whether it's in formal classwork or through um, you know, summer programs or whatever, find those opportunities because the more you do it, the, 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 the easier it will get, the more sense it will make. And um, it's one thing to have a resume that's filled out with all of these classes. There's another thing to be able to think about complex systems and be able to develop new strategies for solving them. Um, 
And the more you use the math, the more you use the physics, the better you'll be able to do the latter. And the latter is what gets you into a career because your job is not to read a textbook when you get to be a professor. Your job is to make discoveries or to teach other people how to make discoveries. So that's one bit of advice. So stick, do as much math, as much calculus, um, you know, as much physics as you can. Um, another bit of advice is, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but find what you're curious in. Find what really excites you that when you make progress on it, you feel good at the end of it. Um, because when you, if you do a PhD or you do a master's in a field, it's going to be hard. And there are going to be times when you come home and you've been working for 20 hours on a problem and you, you, don't, you can't get it to work and you don't understand it and you feel like just giving up. And there needs to be some motivation there beyond just, well, I need to finish the homework because it makes you know, the professor happy. There needs to be an internal motivation for that. If you can find that in physics and astronomy, you can pursue it. If you find that when you're pursuing that, you're much more concerned about, like you're just much more excited about making the software work than you are about the physics, then pursue the software because there's lots of places you can go with the software. And there's you'll always make more money if you can do the, the programming because astronomy will never pay you that much. But if you can do programming really well, there's so many places that you can go um, in India, but abroad as well. You know, you might, if you're really interested in the software, you know, you might get a job with a, um, a medical technology company who needs to analyze patient data and figure out, you know, the likelihood that someone's going to get cancer or something. So if you understand physics and math and statistics, but you also enjoy the computer science of it, then you might be paid very well to do that sort of work. Um, so f be, be honest with yourself. Are you doing this thing because um, you want to do it? Or are you doing this thing because of the satisfaction that you get when your professor gives you an A plus and, or the satisfaction that you get when uh, uh, all your friends say, oh, you must be so smart because you're an, you're an astrophysicist. If you're doing it for that, when you're stuck on a problem, no one's around telling you how great it is, how cool it is that you're an astrophysicist. You have to, it has to be self-motivated. So find those things and you're not going to find it on in one day. You know, over time, you'll realize, I really like the math, or I really like the computer science, or I really like the, the playing around in a laboratory to try to build some new instrument to do something in a different way. And then pursue that. Um, so build your foundation, find the thing that you want to pursue, and go after it. And, you know, if you, if you run into impediments, if they're if there are barriers in your way to finding that success, um, don't think that you're the only one that's ever experienced that and that you should just give up because there, it, there's going to be challenges. Um, there are going to be times when you feel like, I'm just not good enough to do this. Um, if you find that consistently, you know, move into another, you know, parallel stream, but don't, don't necessarily give up on physics altogether. You might, you know, if you already have a degree in physics, maybe find a different way to apply that physics degree than the, the way that you, you start. Yeah, so what's your thoughts on how science and, uh, or science education can be improved in places like Assam, Northeast, to encourage more students to enter fields like astrophysics? Yeah, I think I, think I was really impressed with Tejpur University. Um, the faculty there seemed really... Um, adamant about getting their students connected with people to give them the opportunities, whether it was like within um, IUCA, within connections uh, with um, with the, the Pune like main campus, you know, doing research collaboration. They were um, seemed very, very motivated to get their students engaged in meaningful work, not just doing work, um, but doing work that would could 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 be leveraged in the future would open up new opportunities and pathways to to the field um so in terms of science education um i think that um in india it's it's a lot harder to get into the field that you want because there's just so many more people competing for those spots um so um 
if you don't get into the top, top university that you, you know, the, the best school that you possibly could have gotten into, but you get into a second tier one, it, you might be able to be as successful as an American or a a European university student um, because you already have, you know, maybe a year head start on an American physics student. So use that to your advantage, you know, still put yourself, apply yourself, you know, to your, to those studies, because when it comes to applying for summer internships or for, um, you know, study work abroad or something, um, you may still be competitive, even if you're, if, even if you didn't get into the school that, um, you know, everybody looks at as being the best school for, you know, such and such. Um, what matters is that you have a strong foundation, you're enthusiastic, and that you have people who are willing to um, go to bat for you, I guess, if I can use that cliche. It's a baseball one, but it probably works for cricket too. When you going to bat for you means they're going to stand up for you. They're going to write the letters of recommendation. They're going to give you the projects that are going to advance you into the next stage of your career. Um, at a smaller university, the faculty have maybe fewer students, so they might be a little bit more engaged than they are at the biggest possible university that's the best school. Um, I say a lot to my students here that, you know, um, Harvard is a really good school. You know, the, the faculty at Harvard are the best in the world at what they do. But if you're in a classroom with 200 people, the faculty has no idea who you are. So it doesn't really matter if you're taking a freshman physics class with the best possible physicists in the world. You're probably spending just as much, uh, uh, as much time with them as the best student in that class. So no matter where you are, take advantage of the opportunity of where you where you are and look for opportunities to to do more, to be more engaged, to, um, you know, when you I met a student when I was at Tejpur who was an engineering electrical engineering student, but he was also working a lot with doing the public observing nights when you're applying to a U.S. school um, and you're on your application, you say, I have excellent grades in physics, um, excellent grades in astronomy in my in my courses. Um, mm -hmm. And I also spent time doing public nights in wherever you're based. Um, and I did these public nights in English, for example. You know, these were English based, you know, because all of my speakers, you know, all of the people coming in, they may have spoken any number of languages. So the default was English. That's actually really appealing, can be can be a a point in your favor on an application because if you come to graduate school in the US you're probably going to have to teach teach labs and if you teach labs you're going to teach them in English and if you have a more uh, a, a better grasp of the English language that's really advantageous to you than the best student but who only speaks um you know a single language um or something so yeah. you know find the opportunities to do the things that you're interested in wherever you, wherever you are. Um, yeah. 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 So like, uh, if a student from India, they wants to apply for a PhD, a postdoc, like, uh, suppose in your lab, so how should they approach to you or like, what will be the basic requirements? Like, yeah. Student? So it's kind of frustrating because my program, the university that I'm at, only takes very, very few master's students. And the re part of the reason is because um, the budget is very small and the amount of money that the students get when they do come here is very small. It's very difficult to, um, to live off of just that money alone. It is possible, but it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, the amount at my university that we pay for one year, so nine months, is about $10,000, which sounds like a lot, but the cost of living is much higher even in the area that I live. If they are interested though in coming, the courses that they would take would be in um, physics. It would be a two-year physics master's course. Um, recently, we've ad 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 modified that so that students would take, um, they, they, they're they expected to take a, a, a master's project as well. And so as part of that project, or as part of their training, in addition to the classes that they take in, you know, quantum mechanics and mechanics and E&M, um, they would also take uh, 
research time. Um, and for that, I, I always have projects that they can work on. Um, and then if they're working with me, I'm always going to try to make sure I'm always going to find money for them to to go to a conference to present the work in the US or Europe so that they can get exposed to that. Um, we have rolling admissions so that we can you can apply whenever. Um, but typically, most people come in uh, September or August and um, uh, we, st we start in August and then we're out by May. Um, I can send you the details by email afterwards. I can point you to the site. But in general, when you're applying to any school in the US, um, if you're thinking about doing astrophysics, typically astrophysics is done where we go straight from a bachelor's into a PhD program. So you can apply for master's and sometimes you can use that master's to then enter into the PhD program at the same school, but it's not as common. Typically you're gonna to apply to the PhD program directly. Um, a master's only program is oftentimes uh, giving you an extra year or so of instruction because maybe you didn't do as well as you wanted in quantum mechanics as an undergraduate, but you wanna take it again and, and improve those grades. Um, it's less focused on research um, often because it's just a shorter program. If you're applying to graduate schools, um, they are quite, they can be quite competitive. Um, and what I always advise my students who are looking for grad schools to do is to first start with don't don't apply to 500 universities, because what will happen when you apply to 500 universities is you'll copy and paste and you'll make the same application every time. And when someone on the committee receives that application, they'll say they could have made this application anyone. And then it goes to the bottom of the stack unless they come from, you know, Harvard or something. Then they might get a little bit more consideration. But if you're coming from any other university, they're going to say this person's just copying and pasting. They probably use chat GPT to write the application. We're not going to really care too much about this. Instead, pick a region maybe in the US or Europe that you want to be. Maybe I want to live in Germany. I have I, I know a little bit of German, so maybe I want to live in Germany or I know a little I want I know friends who live in Chicago. So maybe focus yourself on sort of the the central U.S. Find five schools or so. Don't find 20, find five. Find two that would be really good schools, hard to get into. Find two that are middle of the road and find one that's just a backup. I could go there. It's a little bit less more rural. Maybe it would be farther away from people that I'm familiar with, but it would put me in the U.S. and it would give me an opportunity to launch into the career there. And then go onto the website and find all of that information for the school that you can about the program and write the application. The statements that you write are really important because basically what's happening is you're being hired for a job. If you're applying to a Ph.D., you're applying for a job that's going to last five years or six years. And if you write an application that says, I have a background in this, and I know Professor X does this, um, I can apply these skills directly. From day one, I'm ready to go. Or I'm really interested in this. My background is in this. I see there are two faculty who, can, who I can use my abilities to forward. Even maybe I haven't done the exact same science, but I have, you know, Python expertise, and I have a background in general relativity or, I've, you know, whatever. Highlight the connections and try to build the case in the statement that if you were at that university, you would be able to work with these people immediately or very soon after you arrive. That there's some connection between what you're doing and what's being done at the university. And I highlight that because the way that the university in the U.S. works, it's different in, the, in Europe, but in the, if you're applying to a U.S. university, most of the time, the funding for the graduate student or is going to come from for a couple of years from the university itself because they're going to be teaching classes. You'll teach the physics 101 labs or something or astronomy 101 labs. But then your next few years while you're doing your research, that's probably funded by a NASA grant or a National Science Foundation grant. And you need to produce something from that. And so you're going to be working closely with your advisor to make sure you're publishing papers and whatnot. And if your advisor says this is a person in two years that if they were here i'd be i'd be excited to work with because i wouldn't have to retrain them they have interests in what i'm doing they have a background they have strong letters of recommendation um 
I know they're collaborators or something back in India, that's far more um, compelling. Um, even if you don't have the, the, the best possible university credential, if you can write an application that says, I'm really well suited for this university for these reasons, it's, it, it's much, it distinguishes your application. Because a lot of people just write a thousand applications because they just don't care where they're going. But if you don't care where you're going, why are you going to care about where you're going to be when you end up? Like, that's the question that the committee may have to decide. Are you just coming because you want to go to a U.S. university or do you want to do this science that I'm really interested in? Um, if you can make the case that it's the science that they're doing is the science you're really interested in it and you're trained, you have some training or background that can be applied fairly quickly to that science. That's a really good application to a to a, a graduate PhD committee. Yeah. So if we talk about India or India space science, so what's your thought uh, with the recent missions like India Sandrayan? Or what's your perspective on the global interest in exploring the moon and Mars? How significant are these missions? Actually? Yeah, I think that um, if you can get involved with an Indian mission to the to the moon, that's excellent for work in um, around the world. There's a lot of interest in the moon. There's a lot of interest in the solar system. Um, uh, NASA is divided into five different branches, um, excuse me, four different branches. Yeah, there's heliophysics, the study of the sun. There's astrophysics, the study of astronomy, study of stars and galaxies, anything beyond the solar system. There's planetary science, which is the study of all the things in the solar system, as well as the earth itself. And then there's uh, aviation. So how do we, aviation and aeronautics, how do we make better airplanes? If you can study in India, you know, results from uh, a lander, for example, you can go to the US and work with many different groups in planetary science that would be funded through NASA programs that are funded through planetary science. Um, there's a lot of interest in the moon. The moon is, um, you know, every year we say we're going to go back in five years and it never really happens. But every year we do get closer to actually launching spacecraft that will carry people to land on the moon and establish a, a, an outpost on the moon. And the reason we want to go to the moon is varied. But for science reasons, it provides fuel. You know, there's, there's water on the moon. Um, there's material on the moon that we could use to construct the next spacecraft that would take us deeper into the solar system to explore um, deeper. Um, it's a lot cheaper to launch from the uh, moon than it is from the Earth in terms of uh, uh, force or energy because of the lower gravity. Um, there's science that can be done on the backside of the moon, for example, in the radio. Um, you know, the radio observatories on the Earth always have to compete with the TV stations and the radio stations on Earth. But if you put it on the back side of the moon, there's no radio anymore. So there's interest in going back to the moon to do astrophysics. There's interest in going back to the moon to build the next generation of exploration in the solar system. There's interest in the physics or the geology of the moon. The landers on the moon can actually go and pick up rocks and bring them home. And you can study those um, rocks in order, un, in order to understand the history of the formation of the solar system. And that has implications for the history of every solar system, um, whether it's, you know, on the other side of the galaxy or in our in our backyard. So there's there's always been interest. There will always be interest in exploring the solar system. And the first object beyond the Earth and the solar system that's of interest is the moon because it's it's so close. So taking an internship, doing work with um, a planetary scientist on uh, um, uh, the rovers, the Indian rovers on the moon, Ch 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 Chandrayaan, or is it Chandrayaan or Chandrayaan? Uh, Chandrayaan. Chandrayaan. So, you know, get, yeah, looking at those. Oh. It's yeah. kind, of, kind of fuzzy, the Wi Fi. Okay, you're back. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Chan if you can use Chandrayaan data in like a master's pro pro project and understand. Um, and in doing so, you're going to learn about geology, you're going to learn about planetary science, you're going to learn about methods of, of, of analysis, you know, um, 
uh, spectroscopy, um, uh, 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 crystallography, um, X-ray, X-ray crystallography, for example, you might use. When you learn those techniques, those techniques are very useful in PhD programs in planetary science in the U.S. And there are many universities. In fact, there are some universities where um, the only thing they do in space is planetary science. Um, and as I think about it, there are actually more institutions that exist that are like IUCA in the U.S. that study planetary science than there are that just study astrophysics. So there's always interest in that. Um, and then there's also the other interest, which is if you can figure out how to mine asteroids, you can make a lot of money. So as spacecraft get cheaper and cheaper, if you want to go the money making route and mine gold on an asteroid because you want to become the richest person ever, um, you know, if you have a background in rocket science and um, and engineering and and geology um, that could, you know, maybe one day you could you could do that, too. But. I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on that sort of um, field because that's been going on for for 70 years. People have been talking about mining asteroids and still no one has done it. <laughs> so but there are companies that talk about doing it. There's a um, uh, Bigelow Industries, for example, in I think Texas uh, has a plan to go out and capture an asteroid, bring it into low Earth orbit and then mine it and bring the uh, rare Earth elements back to Earth and sell them at a huge profit. But um so yeah yeah so it's the very high time for artificial intelligence and machine learning how do you think uh about the developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning uh will it impact the how it will impact the space science i think you can't understate how important it's going to be um the reason is because um Astronomy often was very small data. You know, you go to a telescope, you observe for a night, you compile all your data, you make an image of a galaxy, and then you study that galaxy. That was how astronomy was done for a long time. We're now in the era where we can, you know, about 20, 25, 30 years ago, maybe we started to collect relatively large amounts of data, but still small enough that human beings could, could process that data. In the next 10 years, a lot of the data that we're going to get in from telescopes on the ground or in space is going to be too big for human beings individually to inspect every single frame in order to see, you know, is there noise that I need to account for? Is there an object here that I should be concerned about um, that I want to study? AI, machine learning will be very important for studying those data. It, it's not going to replace the scientist because someone still has to figure out what is important to look for or what is important to remove. But building a data set where you can make that identification of the set of objects cleanly without having to look through terabytes or petabytes worth of data is really the, the job of, a, of an AI or machine learning. So the other advantage is that all of these tools are gonna to be computational tools. And the more comfortable you are with using a computational tool to do one thing, when the next thing comes up, you're already primed to do the next big thing. And um, there's going to be a real place in astronomy for people who have built systems that can find galaxies or features or stars or whatever of interest from big data sets and are able to do new, new science um, with those. Um, so I don't think you can understate it if you and there's there's it's very easy to get started now like you can find youtube clips from everyone i mean there's so many um software that are out there already to do object classification in the talk that i gave i talked about a software that found um was trained on you know, like human faces to fit, figure out if someone's crying or laughing in a photograph um or to find apples versus bananas you know if you go to like a grocery store now um, there was one in the Mumbai, I think it was the Mumbai airport, maybe it was Abu Dhabi, where you just like walk in with your credit card, you pick up your stuff in the basket, and then when you check out, it just takes a picture and it figures out you've got two apples and that's $2 and you've got three bananas and that's $4. And then it just charges your credit card directly. The training of that software, that's all publicly available in many cases, but you can use that training. 
that train software, that develop software, in order to do things with galaxies or stars or spectra that no one has ever done before. So, you know, start playing around, um, getting your hands dirty, learning how to use Python, learning how to use machine learning tools. Um, and even if you don't do it for astronomy, when you get into a master's program or a PhD, you can say, I actually have this, you know, background already in doing this. Could we use this in, in this science question? And your advisor may say, go for it. And then all of a sudden you may have a paper that no one ever thought about writing before. And you could distinguish yourself um, early um, as an, you know, as an expert, as a developer within this field. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to know about your research and your insights on it. So if we talk apart from research, uh, not only me, uh, our audiences and all common people uh, are curious to know actually how a daily how the daily life of a scientist actually look like and how you spend your daily life like especially the free times when you are not involved in research can we please know about this yeah yeah you you had asked me in the the primer about the uh, like Big Bang Theory is, is that what scientists are like outside of the job? You know, and it, it is true. Like scientists are, there's no, there's no right or wrong way to be a scientist, basically. The, the, the interests among scientists are as diverse as the interests among people generally. Like some people are really obsessed with sports or they're really obsessed with, um, you know, good wine or they're really obsessed with, uh, you know, hiking and backpacking and, and going camping. Like, I think personally, I, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy, um, gosh, I just enjoy exploring. I like, I like going on long backpacking trips, being alone in nature. Um, I enjoy um, exploring places that I've never been before. Not necessarily places that you would, you know, it, not New York City necessarily or Paris, but just like, finding a place that, um, and just wandering around. Um, I don't know if that's really a hobby, but that's something I, I like to do. I'm, I like to let, I like to be curious while I'm being, you know, lazy, you know, by when I'm taking a break still. And so exploring is a way to do that. And so, um, I guess I get fairly involved in political things. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, active in, you know, uh, communicating to politicians um, the importance of of different issues and and um, trying to improve my community for uh, this or that population, or you know, ensuring that um, you know we have um, places that I can explore. You know, <laughs> that there are there are still wild places, or there are still um, um, places to enjoy nature, uh, for example, not just you know. We need to fund, make sure we fund science or something. Um, I enjoy, uh, I like baseball, the sport baseball. Um, my team just lost for the year though, so they're done. So there's not much baseball now for a f uh, f until the spring. Um, but um, I'll probably read most of the winter. It's really cold, really dark in, in Minnesota. I'll be traveling to other places where it's warmer, so that'll be nice. But when I'm home in Minnesota, I, I like to read a lot of historical fiction and whatnot. Um, sometimes in the winter, we get a little bit busier with uh, um, like, you know, games and stuff. Um, I don't play too many video games only because I spend all of my day looking at a computer screen and I don't want to look at a computer screen anymore. Um, but, you know, we play like board games and stuff, um, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is really popular. I don't play too much, but um, I play with friends from time to time with that when we have campaigns and other board games like that. Um, it's just, you know, just a way to relax and um, and have fun without um, uh, going outside where it's too cold to do anything. I like to ski in the winter. Um, I like to run in the summer, bike in the summer, and ski in the winter. Um, it's really nice to be able to do that. We have a small hill. It's not... Northeast, sometimes, like, uh, if you get time, it's really nice, like, Nassar and, like, Nassar and all. Northeast. Yeah. Northeast yeah. And 
Meghalaya and then Mizoram, you know. Yeah, they were saying that when I was there that they went to a, a conference. I think it, they call it the the NEMA North Northeast Northeast Meeting of Astronomers, and they met yeah. in a in a place where that was much farther, much higher elevation, and everyone was like super excited because they got to see the snow. Um, but I don't know if you can ever really snow or ski anywhere downhill um, until you get to like the Himalaya. Um, but uh, and it was it was when I was in Assam two weeks ago. Um, it was really hot. It was like uh, almost forty or something. With and then with the humidity, it was almost it was much higher still. But um, I enjoy heat more than I do it cold, so I didn't mind at all. Yeah. Uh, do you have any favorite science fiction book or movie that inspired you to your interest in space, like space science? Book books wise um i think i think the book that really got me exciting and excited and thinking about astronomy was um stephen hawking's very famous book the brief history of time a brief a brief history of time um i uh actually do i have it up here no um uh, a brief history of time was a book that i read when i was young and I didn't understand any of it. And um, that was kind of good because it made me angry. Why don't I understand this? Like, I should be able to understand this. Like, nothing's so difficult that it couldn't be understood, is it? And then I, so I read it again. Like, every year I try to read it again and, and try to understand a bit more. And even now when I read it, I, I still think about the same sentences I've read before. And I think, man, this is really a, you know, brilliant idea, or this is a really uh, uh, unique insight to the to the way that that physics works. Um, so that was a really exciting book for me. And I was looking for a picture. I don't know if I have it here, though. I had a picture. If you give me one second. Um, yeah. It was such an important book that. Um. Ah, shucks. Oh, well, uh, I can't find the picture, but I used to have a picture on my wall here when I was a uh, when I was in uh, my first semester in college, I went to I took my first trip abroad by myself and I went to England. And when I was in England, I went, I flew into London and was based in London. And um, I didn't really have anything to do, but the only thing I had on my list of things that I must do was I wanted to go to um, Cambridge University where Stephen Hawking's, he was still alive at, at the time where he was based. And I went to his, uh, I went to Cambridge for the day on a, on a, on a trip and, and then uh, just by myself. And I was, wandering around the campus and I found the building where he worked and I thought, well, maybe I'll just go into the building. And I went to the building and I found his office and I took a picture of his office. And when I took a picture of his office, his secretary um, was in the office next to him and she saw me and she said, oh, are you here for an appointment or something? I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm just like a, I'm just a pilgrim. I'm just here doing a pilgrimage to Stephen Hawking's office because he really inspired me as a kid. And she said, oh, it's unfortunate he's not here. He was sick. He, he, he had to go to the hospital. He had uh, some, uh, 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 like a cold. Uh, uh, and with him, like if he ever got sick, it was a really big deal because he was so um, uh, uh, medically fragile, I guess, because of his uh, condition. And she said, well, it, um, he's not here, but if you'd like to go into his office, I can let you in and you can, you can just look around if you like. And I said, oh my goodness, sure. And uh, she let me in and uh, I lay down on his couch and I sat behind his desk and I looked out of his window and um, just had the office to myself for about like, I was, I felt like I was in there for an hour, but I probably was there for like 10 seconds because I was so nervous. But um, yeah, it was a, it was a very, um, um, it was a very nice moment. I never met him, I, but I, I got to see his office and I think um, because I read the book when I was probably in middle school, when I first tried to read it and I didn't get it at all. Um, and then here I was, you know, 15 years later, or 10 years later, 
um, you know, in, in that place. That was, that was a really nice uh, a moment for me uh, growing up. But so I think that was a big book. There's lots of good books out there. Um, um, I like, I would just advertise books um, just for fun. These aren't like physics books, but just for fun um, related to science. Um, Cosmos by Carl Sagan, um, Contact by Carl Sagan. And then he's written a lot of other work, books um, uh, on sort of science, uh, science education and science literacy. Um, Demon Haunted World is one that he wrote. Um, then there's a very popular book by Richard Feynman called Surely You Must Be Joking, Mr. Mr. Feynman. Um, that's a book that shows him as a real person. I mean, as you know, he was a Nobel Prize winning genius uh, uh, physicist. Um, but he's also a real person. And it, it, that was a good book to read as a kid because it made you realize that you don't have to be some superhuman God in order to do good things in physics. Maybe in order to win the Nobel Prize, you need to be really better than everyone else. But um, you can still have a uh, engaging career and engage your curiosity as a, as a, as a job um, by being... Um, passionately curious, I guess, is the phrase that st sticks in mind. Um, uh, Stephen Hawking once said, um, um, to paraphrase, um, no, excuse me, it was Einstein, the, the quote I'm thinking of. Einstein bit said, to paraphrase, he said, um, I believe it was Einstein. Anyway, um, I, I to, to paraphrase, he said something to the effect of, I'm, I'm not a genius. I'm merely passionately curious. Um, and um, what really matters in this job, I guess, if you're if you're looking at it as a career, you, you have to be passionately curious because the money isn't going to make you happy. <laughs> the the hours aren't going to make you happy. The you have to be able to be to find joy in curiosity. And if you can do that then the world is your oyster. You can, you can, you can find a way to make it work. So. Yeah. Uh, have you ever watched the popular US sci-fi series, The Big Bang Theory? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I have, yeah. I have. Yeah. So what do you think, or what's your thought about the character Rajas Kutrapalli from The Big Bang Theory? Does it really reflect the life of an astrophysicist in US? Hollywood. I mean, it's, it's a bit contrived, but the, um, the interactions that, that you see on that show, um, the excitement that you see between the characters, like, um, when, uh, you know, one of them has a problem to solve at work and they're just stumped by it, or they're really, um, uh, frustrated because they can't solve something. And, and that drives the whole plot line for the show. Like that's, that kind of is like what life is like. Um, uh, when I, I've worked a, a couple of times for, you know, a month or here, a month or so at a time at Caltech, which is um, in Pasadena where the show is, takes place. And they actually have a street that's called Big Bang Way, um, the Big Bang Theory Way um, in the downtown area. Um, but when you're walking around Caltech, you know, it, it is like that. People are asking questions of each other all the time. You know, what do you think of this? I can't figure this out. Let, let's stop and get a coffee and figure this out. Like, it is a really exciting place to be. And the show does kind of reflect that. And the nice thing about the show is that, um, I forget her name, but one of the one of the characters that came in, in the later seasons that dates um, or married, I guess in the, in the show, they got married actually, um, but one of them actually has a PhD in, I think mathematics. Um, but not everyone, most of the people on the show are actors and they have no idea what they're saying when they, one of the characters actually has a PhD in something math, mathematics or something. It's or something, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the other ones are all actors. And I remember hearing on an interview with, uh, one of them, like Leonard or someone was on an interview and he was, he was saying that, or Leonard's care, Leonard's actor, whoever. I don't know the actor's name, but they said, yeah, we have no idea what we're saying. We're just, we're just saying what we're told to say. But in the show, they do consult with uh, uh, physicists and astronomers. And um, when we were in grad school is when it first came out and we watched the show pretty regularly. 
And we were always really excited when like a picture that we took would be, if you look at the, the, um, um, the refrigerator in the background and the, the whiteboard that's in their, their apartment, they like change out the pictures, they change out the equations. And, you know, the first person to figure out like what they were trying to solve, it was always a game we played watching it. Or if they changed the picture on the refrigerator, like if it was a picture of something you were studying, like we bought beers for everyone or you had to buy beers for everyone. Or so like, it was a fun, it was a fun show to watch in grad school because it was, it wasn't really reality, but it was, you know, closer to reality that we were living than, than not. Um, they seem like yeah. me. Um, and everyone's really nerdy and that's okay. Everyone's nerdy in their own way. They all have these. And the thing about science is that it's a community where nerdiness is, where, however that comes out is, is um, supported, you know, encouraged, you know, because you want to be, you want to have the most curious people to work with. And the most curious people, they can be people who wear suits to the office every day and wake, you know, want to work nine to five and they're very productive, but there are also people who don't fit that mold. And there's a lot of room. And on the show, I think they show a lot of the different personality types. Um, they're sometimes caricatures. They're not um, true people, but um, they show sides of what it's like. So it's a neat, it's a neat show. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot more drama than in reality, I think, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we assume that you, uh, you can travel anywhere in space, so where would you go and why uh, if you get the chance? In space? Yeah, yeah, in space. Well, I guess there's a there's a practical issue of you could only go so far before you, you die just because space travel goes so slow. But if I had anywhere that I would want to go in the solar system, in principle, yeah. I guess I could get anywhere in the solar system in a lifetime. Um, I think that the most exciting place to go would probably be, it would probably be Saturn, like the moons of Saturn um, and the rings of Saturn. To be able to like, you know, sort of dive up and down through the rings of Saturn would be really neat. And then there are so many... Uh, weird moons around Saturn. Saturn has the most moons of any planet. And um, most of them are really tiny, but some of the big ones are really big. And like to stand on an icy surface and to see like geysers of water coming up from the beneath, from an ocean under underneath um, would be really incredible and it'd be really exciting if you could like gather some of that water and see if there's any little bugs in it because to to know that to be able to find life elsewhere in the universe on a you know on a trip to a, a place would be really exciting um yeah. but yeah i think it would be saturn yeah that's nice so like uh let's come to the end of the conversation okay. yeah so, like, how do you think the platform like YouTube uh, help can uh, help to connect scientists like your view and like with audience around the world and especially in smaller regions like like Assam and Northeast and all. So, how like, platform like YouTube can help? Well, I think uh, I'm I'm trying to do what I can do by by visiting these places. Um, and to try to make make those connections because it's a lot easier to it's really the world is really connected now but it's connected in a very superficial way through the internet um it used to be that if you sent a letter to someone it was it was really meaningful you know you got a letter from someone you would read it you'd reply to it but nowadays like it's so easy to send an email that a lot of emails just get dropped or deleted so it's really hard to make meaningful connections with people um so it's more important now than ever to actually go to places and meet people. Um, so I think the, I, the idea that I, that I have is um, to, to, be, to be in places, not just to um, absorb information about other places, 
um, but to actually go to those places in order to know what they're like. Um, the view that you get of a place or a person or a thing from the internet is not the true representation of that thing. It's a very superficial view. And so what I would say for someone on the other side is that it's, if you're very excited about something and you've been thinking about it for a while and you're interested in it and you want to engage in it further with someone that you know through a, you know, an online forum or a, you know, YouTube or something like that, um, you may want to reach out to them. Um, but only reach out if you're very serious about following that up and you want to do something with that, not just, you're not just asking them to help you satisfy a curiosity, but you know, what, what sort of partnership might develop, what sort of connection might be made. Um, it's really important to, to, to do that rather than just, um, you know, leave a comment on someone's uh, Instagram page or something, because it's very easy to leave a comment and it's probably not going to be read and it's never going to be acknowledged. And, um, but if you can say to someone, you know, I've been watching your YouTube series for a year and now I'm graduating from high school and I'm looking at colleges um, and I really think I'd be an excellent candidate. Is there, you know, any way that we might connect on this? They might still just ignore it, but they might respond and say, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm starting a new program. And I was, you know, looking for some people in India, actually, because I have a connections in India already that I wanted to firm up, you know, but only if you're like ready to connect with them in a serious way. Um, reach out, you know, um, because I think nowadays when you reach out with people online, it's very superficial and it, it's, it's never clear from the, from the first email, um, how serious the conversation is going to be. And so if you can demonstrate your seriousness from the get go, um, it might, it might result in a, in a real connection that could develop further. Um, when you are like at a place that has access to, um, you know, conferences, travel, um, collaborations beyond, you know, your own university or your own state, um, take advantage of those um, because, you know, we have, um, I, I was talking to some of the students at Tejpur and they said that the, um, or I gave them the link to a, um, uh, an astronomer's list of conferences that happen every year. And I said, you know, you may not think that um, you're prepared to go to a conference on this, this field that you're studying. Um, but if you can go to a conference that's in your region, that's run through a, um, th for example, the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, um, even though it's being hosted in Thailand, there may be European and US and Japanese and Chinese astronomers that also attend. And if you can be in that room and have a make a connection with someone or give a talk on your research and have someone come up to you afterwards and say, hey, I, I, I think what you're doing is really interesting or um, I think you should consider this in your research. Now you've made a real connection that would never have been established if you just emailed that person and said, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing and I'm doing something similar. Do you want to collaborate? They'll probably say, I don't know who you are. It's so difficult to know who's re real or, or not and um, what's junk or spam mail and what's real. And so, you know, go, you don't have to go to Europe to make a connection. Let the Europeans come to you or um, meet them halfway at a conference that's a little bit more manageable for you to attend financially or time-wise or something. Um, and go there with a serious intent to present your research and to advertise what you're doing and to make a connection, not just to go for, um, uh, you know, to be in the, to, to say you've been to a conference, you know, um, you know, have, have goals of what you want to take away from that conference. Um, and it's a lot easier once you've gone to a conference and met someone, even if the first conversation kind of fizzles out three years later, when you run into them at a conference again, and now you've really got a lot of work to show them. And now they're also hiring postdocs and you're looking for a postdoc that might turn into a job. And if you had emailed them twice over two years, they may never have given you the time of day because they just didn't know if you, how serious you were. But if they see you twice, then 
you know, it's much easier. So. Uh, as we wrap up, we would like to express our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Michael Rutkowski for sharing his fascinating insights into the world of astrophysics and space exploration. His work both in research and education continues to inspire students and scientists alike. Uh, thank, thank you once again from the whole team duty for your valuable time and sharing this uh, sharing this valuable thoughts and insights to our audience. Thank you so much for all watching this video. Thank you.